footprint hockey actually leaves, but we'll leave that for another day. You know, I, I was listening to the conversation just before we began, and uh, of course, there's so much of a serious nature going on these days. I'm kind of glad we arranged to spend a little bit of time together and talk about something and lighten things up uh, just a little bit and talk about a topic, hockey, which of course means something to most Canadians. Uh, but what does it have to do with Israel? Well, let, let me read you something I received on the 18th of March, 1994, uh, from a friend of mine. He wrote to me this. It's to, attention, Mr. Mike Rubin, Israel National Ice Hockey Team. To Mike and all Team Israel, keep the spirits up and hang tough. I know that you guys have been giving it all you have. Just do it one more time. This time it is our turn. We have come a long way since the first time we played South Africa. The time is ripe to take them. They've been playing hockey in South Africa for more than 25 years. We have been playing for four years. We can take them. You can take them. Do it. I'm with you guys all the way. Signed, Mark Telesnik. So, I don't know, where, where should I begin with this whole thing of hockey? Uh, I think we called it, we titled it, uh, hockey, playing hockey in Israel and for Israel, a story of identity and an integration. So what do I mean by that rather bombastic title? Let me go back in time to another date. Sunday, October the 18th, 2020. Anybody remember where they were that time? What's special about that day? Probably not much, because I imagine most of you would simply recall that as being back in time, uh, some in between two waves of COVID when we were kind of in some optimistic limbo, uh, not sure what that imminent second wave was going to look like. For me, it was the last time that I laced up a pair of skates, albeit on in physically distant seats around the perimeter of the ice surface to play hockey with my buddies for the weekly Sunday evening game at Garnet Williams Arena, where I've been playing almost since I arrived in Canada with my family from Israel back in 2002. So what struck me as particularly poignant, speaking about hockey this time, as perhaps any other sport activity and pretty much any other group activity, whether it's social, cultural, or otherwise, is the absence of that in-person experience. And when we think about what we miss most about those experiences, we would probably first mention simply being with other people in their company. And what is it about that in-person interaction that's so important for us? Well, much of it, of course, is social, emotional, psychological. But for me, with hockey, there's also the tangibly sensual element. What do I mean by that? When I recall hockey, I think of the aural and the vocal, calls for a pass that never comes, pucks hitting the boards rather than the back of the net, the friendly cajoling remark, you play like a 60 year old, which I suppose is less insulting than it was 15 years ago. But even more, I can actually sense those familiar aromas, the smell of freshly cleaned ice, the sweet pleasance of a recently laundered hockey sweater, and of course, the slowly encroaching pungence of hard-earned sweat within the intimacy of a square metrically challenged dressing room. Uh, but enough of that local nostalgic banter. Let me go back to another date. October, sometime in October 1975. It was the first time I ever played organized hockey at age 16. Although we did have a skating rink in our backyard for a couple of winters a few years earlier, I'd been convinced by my friend, a very talented goaltender, that I should come and play with him in what used to be called the NYHL, the North York Hockey League. And of course, deluded by my vanity, I agreed. Despite my limited abilities, I was able to endear myself to my teammates by working hard and scoring a flute goal in my first game. But there was one game not too long after that, and I should mention that at that time, I wore a kippah all the time, and I wore a kippah to my hockey games. And of course, I, I needn't tell you that in most hockey leagues, certainly back in the 70s, uh, my friend and I were the only Jews on the team. And the people who played on our team were far from those whom you might call familiar with Jewish culture and Jewish practice. However, there was one game, I don't remember the team we were playing, but a rather disparaging remark regarding my religious affiliation was made by a member of the other team. 
And I remember one of my teammates, Ray, with hair down below his shoulders, uh, missing a tooth in the front. Uh, I won't say that, you know, looking like a typical hockey player, but somebody whom I might have expected to be and show that he was indignant about some about a girlfriend or about his hockey play. He got up and he knocked that player over the boards into the opposing team's bench. And that struck me as something that stayed with me for a long time, because here was this person who never probably had much contact with Jews, but because I was a member of his, he felt that it was incumbent upon him to defend a player that was insulted by the opposing team. And that was something that stayed with me for, for many, many years in terms of my hockey experience. Uh, the idea that Hockey is not just something you watch on TV, but hockey is something you can play and find something in common with those with whom you might not find much else in common. And I didn't really have a lot of appreciation for that uh, before that, because I wasn't one of those kids whose parents got up early on a Saturday morning to drive them to hockey practices. Uh, my activity of choice, or I should say my parents' choice, was junior congregation at Beth David on Saturday mornings. Okay. Let's jump to Sunday, November the 25th, 1990. I'm just gonna share a screen with you for a moment. Just give me a thumbs up somebody if you can see it come up on the screen. It's black right now, Michael. It's still black, Ooh, okay. Still black? I see my connection isn't great. There's, it's frozen. Can you hear me, Cora? The map's there? We can see it now. Fantastic. Thank you for your patience. So if you can see my cursor, on that Sunday morning in 1990, I was in a small town in the Czech Republic called Česky Tejan uh, on the Olza River just across from a similarly named Polish town of Czesin. I just pulled out my skates from my rental car and gotten onto an outdoor rink where adults and kids were playing shinny. So I might ask you, what the heck was I doing in the Czech Republic on the border with Poland in November of 1990? Now, let me just go back for a moment. I'd been back in Canada for three months, having lived in Israel for five years, just before I was supposed to be inducted into the army. I worked at a place in Haifa, the Lilbeck Education Center, doing all sorts of activities with exchange programs, programs, including with Germany, and having immersed myself in academic and experiential study of the Shoah, and deciding that before going into the army, on my way back to Israel, I was going to stop and visit everything I could having to do with the Shoah in Poland. And so I rented a car in Belgium, remember that country, it'll come up a little bit later, and drove across uh, Germany, keep in mind 1990, I traveled through what used to be East Germany, stayed in Weimar overnight. This was five months after the Pink Floyd concert on July the 21st, 1990, and I happened to be in Berlin at that concert at the Berlin Wall with an exchange group back in 1990. So here I was five months later driving through Germany, and I decided just before I stopped in, uh, on my way to Poland, I stopped at the border here because I did notice these people playing hockey. And so they might ask, whoa, whoa, so hold it. You got the sense of where I was going in terms of my travels. What was I doing with a bag of hockey in my car? What, like, why would I be schlepping a bag of hockey from Canada back to Israel? Well, let me give you some setting for that. Back in 1989, I'd found out somehow that there was some hockey going on in a place called Ramat Gun at a very oddly shaped ice rink. Um, I went down there, met a guy from Czechoslovakia, of all places, who'd moved to Israel years before. His name was Pavel. And we got to talking, and I asked him, well, do you have a pair of skates and a stick? I'd be happy to join you and the, and the kids on the ice. So I did. I went for a skate with him. And to make a long story short, that was my introduction to hockey in Israel, ended up playing for that Ramat Gun team. They'd, they'd uh, set up a league uh, around that time. 
And when I went back to Canada, I decided I was going to bring my hockey equipment with me. So why was that an impressionable experience for me? Because kind of anticipating, but not having a clue what awaited me in Treblinka, in Auschwitz. And if you take a look here, I'm going to move the map a little bit. Hopefully it works. Ah, there we go. Just give me a second here. So I happened to be right near the Polish border and I was on my way to Auschwitz, which of course is Auschwitz. Stayed in Krakow, Krakowia overnight and then drove to Auschwitz the next day. And perhaps having that hockey bag with me and having hockey equipment with me was something, I guess, in anticipation of the challenging experience that awaited me in, in Poland, uh, you might call it a bit of a security blanket. Uh, something that gave me a sense of comfort and familiarity before embarking and immersing myself in what I knew was going to be a very challenging experience. And of course, that experience in Poland is a story for another day. But I thought that was important because this is something that stayed with me and was a very significant part of my experience in hockey internationally with Israel in the coming years. Whoa, 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 you know what? <laughs> I'm just thinking, this is, this is kind of getting out of hand. I said we were supposed to be talking about something on a bit of a lighter uh, scale and not, not getting so heavy with this. This is more like what I would do on my Parsha Plus classes on Thursday for those who are so masochistically inclined. But this re evening really should have a lighter tone to it. And actually what I would have loved to do is maybe ideally involve some people who might have shared some of those hockey experiences with me. You know, perhaps I could ask my partner Iris to join us. But actually, you know, when I think about it, I really met her after I had most of my international experience. And I think she only saw me play once in any case, and that was here in Canada. And besides, she'd be more familiar with the complaints about pain and fatigue than any of the really interesting narrative. All right, so I won't bother asking her. Maybe my father, although I think my parents only saw me play once in competition, and you know how subjectively clouded a parent's recollection can be. So let's forget about that. You know what? I got a better idea. Let me see if I can get a friend of mine to join us. Oh, I remember that letter from Mark Telesnik? He's somebody who was involved with me for quite a while. Let me give him a call. He lives in Israel. I'm just going to try to reach him now. Maybe he's got a few minutes to join us here. Give me one second. Uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment. Let's see if I can find him here. All right, just one second here. Let's try calling him. Hello? Hello, Mark. Who is it? Mark, the mic. Mashlumcha. Mike, it's three in the morning. So what? You never is sleep. Right? You is everything all right? You never sleep anyway. You know what? I, I should have called you before, but I'm here with my congregation. I'm supposed to talk a little bit about my experience with hockey, Israeli hockey. And as a matter of fact, you know, I didn't think of the connection, but I wrote, I read a letter from you that you wrote to me just before the South Africa game in Barcelona in 1994, you know, wishing us the best of luck. You know, we, we lost to them the last time. And we, so I thought, you know, you'd be a- three in the morning. All right, so what, you're already up. What's the difference? I was, I was just thinking, how would you like to join us? I'll, I'll, I'll quickly send you the Zoom link. Maybe you just want to join us for a few minutes and we can share a little bit of nostalgia with, with the group here. What do you say? Okay, I'm I'm, send, I'm sending the Zoom link right now. Okay, okay. But you're gonna tell them all the funny stuff that you did, man. Well, that's I, I started off a little heavy, so I thought you might lighten things up a bit. Okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm waiting for you to come in now. Okay, I just sent you the link. Okay, I'll take me a second to turn it. Okay, no problem. I'll, hopefully, we'll see you in a minute. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. All right. No, I'm kind of glad I thought of that because it, I, I, it was getting a little out of control with my uh, philosophical uh, approach to this thing. I think let, let's let's try to do things in a little, a little different manner. So let's get rid of that map. I think that's that's a little heavy as it is. And uh, hopefully Mark will be with us in just a moment. Um,
Hey, Mike, can you hear me? I can hear you. Whoa. Hey, Mark. Great to see you, man. <laughs> Looking good. But you don't look like you've been sleeping. Nah, nah, nah. I don't sleep. You know that. Yeah. You want to spill the beans? Not yet. Not yet. No, no, not. It's not. It's not worth it yet. Um, you know, I, I was thinking. We had some other guys. We. Whoa! Oh, Dad! Where'd you come from, man? Holy cow! Well, it's good to see you. How, how did you know about this program? I, you know, it's all over the manor. It's all over Bathurst Manor. I don't believe. Like, who is that? This is amazing. You remember Odette? No way, man. What what did you do to your hair? It's Ron. Business Ron, in the front, party in the back. Holy cow. Ron, ya oh, Allah. Goodness. Ya Allah. Well, Ron, how did you hear about this? The refrigerator grew. <laughs> uh, Ron, tiftak mute. Ron, we always heard your voice nice and loudly, so you get, get rid of the mute. Genia, man. How's it going, on, guys? Oh, oh, no, God, no. Don't do a car accident, man. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not driving. I'm in the passenger seat. <laughs> so oh, we're it, okay. It looks like you're driving in a golf cart there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> hey, great to see you guys. Oh. This is you. Good to see you, Mike. I can't believe. Well, you know what? Wow, this this is this is amazing. I, I can't believe you're all here. <laughs> well, you, you know what? If if you're already here, I, you probably know that I'm I'm kind of trying to share some experiences uh, with my Israel hockey uh, career, as as short as it was back in the early '90s, and maybe I can get you guys to share something as well. So you know what? I, what I thought was maybe. Let's just kind of go around. Maybe each of you say a little bit about where you are now, what you're doing now, and when you first got involved in hockey, period, and maybe who your idol was when you were growing up. Who your hockey idol was. Ron, why don't you start? You look like you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Is it, can you hear me actually now? I, uh... Yeah. Okay, terrific. Um, well, right now I live in Canada. Um, my hockey career started uh, in 92, I would guess, somewhere around no, there, 91, 92. Yeah, 91, 92. And uh, pretty much anybody you see on the screen is uh, how my hockey career shaped itself to be where it is and why I am here today. Um, hockey Idol. Who was my hockey idol? Probably Oded. <laughs> <laughs> You have learned tact, Ron. I must. <laughs> you're with it. You're with it. Listen, you got to give some happiness to this guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> at, at our age, we'll take anything we get, Ron. It's okay. Not a problem. All right. Mark, what about you? Okay. So I'm actually in Toronto, but um, I live in Israel. I'm, I'm here on a short sabbatical. And we were cleaning out one of the closets in my mom's apartment and I found my first hockey shirt. So I used to play for the Mighty Mites of the Finchhurst Boys Club. I was number six, Ronnie Ellis. I was six years old. I, was, I guess I was six years old. And I played hockey for mm -hmm. a while in Canada. And then I moved to Israel when I was, I just finished university. And I figured I would never play hockey again but I took my skates just in case. And in 1986, the very first ice rink was opened in Israel and I taught skating and ice hockey there. And then down the road, I got to meet probably in order. I got to meet Mike and then I got to meet Ron, who was this Israeli kid. He was 13 years old. He taught himself how to play hockey and to skate. It was like a refrigerator on the ice. He's actually gotten smaller since then. Um, and, he, and, and right away, we saw that this guy was going to be able to play hockey. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. And he was only 13 years old. He had never played. And we actually got him into the first tournament Israel ever played. You were supposed to be 16, and we lied about his age. He was 14. Um, we lied about a lot of things in that first tournament. Then I met Oded. Oded was at that tournament. And then the next year, or two years later, I met Jenya. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in cars driving back and forth between Haifa and Batyam. Yeah, cool. 
So you know what, just before I ask Oded to say something, I just want to read something to you. And this is something my that was sent to me, uh, or somebody sent, sent it to me back in the 25th of March, 1992, from Haaretz, the uh, Israeli newspaper. I'll read it in Hebrew and then I'll translate it. Nitzachon histori b'hoki kerach, Yisrael gavra al Turkiya shmonestein. Johannesburg, Nifcherat hoki akerach she Yisrael zakfa lizchuta nitzachon histori. במשחקה השני בלבד, בענף זה, ניצחה את טורקיה שמונה שתיים באליפות העולם לדרג גימל. So this is from Johannesburg. A historic victory in, in ice hockey. Israel defeated the Turkey 8 to 2. את השערים לישראל הבקיעו עוזי לי, שלוש, וורד פרסן, שתיים, מרק פלזניק, עודד אורגיל ורן עוז. רן תיכוניסט כבן 16 הבקיע את השער היפה ביותר במשחק, וזו הפעם השנייה בלבד שהוא מופיע על משטח חוקי קרח. You know, things sometimes get exaggerated and changed a little bit, but it says that the goals for Israel were scored three by Uzi Li, two by Ward Parson, one by Mark Palesnik, you know, spelling isn't their strength, I guess, with hockey players, Oded Orgil, and Ron Oz. And Ron, a high school student, uh, age 16, uh, scored the nice is the most beautiful goal of the game, and this was his only, only his second time that he was on a regular-sized hockey rink. Uh, the second line, I, sh I shouldn't spoil it by reading the next line, Amishak HaRishon, Nachla Yisrael in its first game, Israel suffered a rather devastating loss, 23-4 to Spain. Anyway, on that note, I'll hand things over to Oded. I don't know what, I can't beat that, Mike, after uh, that synopsis. Um, again, I'm Oded Orgel. I was born in Israel. I was unique in the sense that I joined the team actually from Canada. I live in Toronto with my wife and, and five children. Um, my first experience with hockey, with hockey Israel was I was actually articling in London, Ontario, uh, as a young lawyer. And my mother called me up in January or February and said, do I know of a goalie with an Israeli passport? <laughs> and, and I, and I called and I said, I know lots of Jewish kids who play hockey. You know, why, you know, why do you need to go? My mother didn't know anything about hockey. And she said, there's, they're extending some team from Israel to South Africa. So I said, listen, if they're so desperate to look for a goalie in London, Ontario with an Israeli passport, tell them I'll put on the pads. Um, and I, got, I spoke a couple of days later with the coach and he said, no, no, we found a goalie. I said, okay. And he goes, tell me about your hockey experience. I said, look, I played as a kid. It's not been my main sport, but I played intramural. And he goes, wait a minute, you have your own skates? I said, yeah. He goes, you know how to hold a stick? I said, yeah, and six weeks later, I flew to South Africa and got to meet uh, all these, well, actually, genuinely, you're after, but I got to meet all these guys uh, and got to experience, yes, the 23-4 to loss, the 8-2 win, and where I scored a goal. I think that was my one and only goal in international hockey. Um, but yeah, it's been quite a, an experience over the last almost 30 years with Israel hockey for me. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Oded. Now, Jenny, I'll turn to you because I know if you'd been playing with us in 1992, we might have won a couple more games. I have no <laughs> doubt about that whatsoever. So, Jenny, maybe say a little bit about <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, first, first, yeah, thanks for inviting me to do this. And uh, <laughs> like Oded said, I don't think anybody can meet your introduction, but um, I, th I came over to Israel in 92 um, in September. So uh, I came from Russia. I was born in uh, Krasnoyarsk, Siberia. So I played my hockey there. I was fortunate enough to, you know, have some elite coaching over there and uh, play at that level. And I think it was 16, 16, just turning 17 when I moved to Israel. And then, funny enough, actually, when I moved over there, uh, I was hoping to find some hockey, but you know, but I wasn't sure. So the way life works out, I guess, my dad actually went to went to the mall in Haifa. And I don't know if you guys remember, I can't remember the name of the mall. Uh, it was 
so long ago. And uh, and he saw there was a small rink there, like a skating rink. So he went to shop with my mom, I think, and they saw the rink and went to talk to some people and apparently met uh, another Russian guy there, Yakov. And uh, from there on, it just somehow Yakov knew the guys, uh, the national team. And then I think in 1993, I guess, was my first time uh, when I went with the national team. I think it was at uh, South Africa, I think, the first trip. I can't remember. No, sorry. Was it South Africa? Uh, maybe uh, Slovenia. 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 Slovenia, I think. Yeah, Slovenia we went to. So, so that's how it started. And then right now, I live in Canada. I live in Barrie, just north of Toronto. I run a hockey academy full time uh, for the last few years for girls mainly. And now going back into boys hockey, I got to play junior A hockey in Canada since 1994 and played some minor pro in, uh, in the US and a little bit in Germany. And been doing uh, my coaching career now, it's been uh, since. 2000, so 21 years now, um, and I guess Israeli hockey is how I got here. I, I don't guess it, it is how I got here. So, because we had Marshall Uretsky, who was our coach for the national team one year, saw me and a few other guys, including including Ronnie, and um, we uh, got a chance to go for a tryout in 1994 in the summer and uh, we went to Bellingham in Washington in the BCHL and um, none of us made it I don't think that year but uh, well that time but I was fortunate enough to come back to Toronto um, and make the uh, junior A team there I made the North York Rangers back then and then played two uh, two more years after in Shelburne and you know so so that's the connection there is huge. And then with, obviously with all of the boys on uh, on the screen right now, and that's how we met each other. And to this day, I mean, the connection, I'm, I'm actually, I apologize if I'm in the vehicle, but I, uh, I have to go to a meeting and I'm actually in Florida right now with our girls team out of all places. And uh, Odette's daughter is actually with me over here to, <laughs> To do some hockey, so so I have to I have to take care of her here while, <laughs> while we while we down here. Uh, but no, but it's um, can't complain. I can't even begin to uh, you know the you guys know my friend Sergey. You know my you know, all of you guys know him. he's in Toronto. We met through hockey in Israel. Um, I mean, there's so many people, really, and, and and it's it's pretty amazing to have, you know, still have guys, you know, Ed and Ron, we um, just saw each other and, you know, see each other, uh, if not frequently, um, you know, steady, and uh, we all live in the same area and we're all involved in hockey, so... so that's how it goes, I guess, and I haven't, I haven't talked to Mike in, how long, like, 20, 25 years, uh, I think, uh, and Mike, you know, when I came over and I played in North York, I remember you actually, you helped me um, get situated with with a, a high school, and if you're, I can't remember what school it was, if you remember, you know, uh, yeah. so, it's, you know, there, there's so, so many stories there, um, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty impressive, I mean, the trips we've had and all of that, obviously. But amazing, but this is how basically that's how I ended up here. I, I don't know if I would have ended up in Canada if I did not go to Israel and play for the Israeli national team. And uh, being being the captain for for four years, three or four years uh, on the team, that that was a privilege. And um, you know, I starting at a young age. I think I was only eighteen when I was picked captain. So so that was that was yeah, that was a privilege to do that. Well, Genia, if you, I, you, I know you said you have to get to a meeting. I just want to show you something, Genia, because uh, I've had this package that you gave me 25 years ago. 
I'm not sure what the circumstances were. Um, you asked me to keep it for you. But I'm afraid. I need to, I need to get it back. <laughs> And Jenya, I want to, well, there's, there's stuff I won't show, don't worry. But the, I want to put something up on the screen, Jenya, and if you, can, if you can read this for everybody, what does it say? Mike, move uh, it up. Can, you, can you move it a little bit? There we go. There we go. Can you, yeah. That says Sokol, which, is, which means falcon. And Krasnoyarsky, so that's that's the, that's my hometown's team, professional team, uh, the hockey club. So that's where I grew up. That's who I grew up playing for. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember where it came from. Yeah, so Jenny, how just I so got Jenny, it. But so Jenny, it's just so you know, amazing we'll, that you have it. We'll talk afterwards, but I have a whole package of stuff from your hockey career in uh, Krasnoyarsk and other places in Siberia, as well as a ton of family photos. Um, Nothing compromising, don't worry. But uh, we'll we'll be in touch, and I'll get this to you as soon as I can. I've been looking forward to the opportunity to return it to you. Anyway, we also have, I think he's here with us, uh, another f colleague of ours, Sergei Gudzik. Um, Sergei, can you hear me? He's been trying to get on the phone. I don't think he's been able to, Mike. I, I see him here. He's, oh, Sergei, you do? Okay. Sergei, unmute Hello? Yourself. <laughs> How's my mute? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Sergey. I just, I just asked you to, you know, to, to. Uh, Sergey comes from a perhaps a, a a familiar type of hockey background where um, your use of language might be somewhat less uh, less less filtered than, than we're used to. But Sergey, go ahead and tell us a little bit about where you're from how you got involved with hockey initially and, and you, a little bit about your experience of hockey in Israel. Okay, where I'm from, everybody knows. <laughs> the Kolkhoz, the Kolkhoz. <laughs> <laughs> now, so I grew up in a, a beautiful city called Kiev. This is where Babi Yar is, where they kill 150,000 of Jews. And uh, hockey for me, it's uh, part of my life. And when I came to Israel, I uh, met Jenna for some reason. And then uh, I met Odette in South Africa. I met Ron in Israel. And I played hockey. Here you go. Close enough? Sounds good. <laughs> t t tell me, Sergey, when you when you were growing up playing hockey, which hockey player did you admire? Who who's your hockey idol? I like Ukrainian people, like Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when uh, when uh, Walter had a stroke, he forgot English. He spoke Ukrainian. Just for you, just so you know. That's news to me, but and, I try. Uh, <laughs> I like, uh, otherwise, I like uh, myself. Very nice. I'm very good. I, uh, I don't like Borat. <laughs> because he said that uh, uh, he was bad-mouthing, uh, you know, people who sell F-35 to Israel. I don't like him no more. And the uh, other hockey players uh, who is nice is uh, Alia Harapov. I like him. Okay. All right. Let, let, me, let, let me ask you guys and whoever wants to go first. Uh, tell, me, tell me what was the craziest memory you have of hockey in Israel? So I'm going to tell one to start off with. Uh, and Mark kind of hinted at this before. Uh, I remember when we were first, you know, before there were all the facilities that you might have liked to have, such as uh, uh, an Olympic-sized rink in Batula, uh, the national team used to practice down in, in Batyam at uh, a decently-sized rink, but not, not olympic size, of course. And, of course, most of us who came from Haifa, uh, we had to drive down there. And the ice times that they gave us for practicing were from between about 10 at night until midnight. I don't remember which day of the week it was, whatever it was. And so we would drive down from Haifa, we'd spend two and a half, 
hours, you know, finishing well after midnight. And then I remember driving back, I had a small Suzuki Jeep at the time. And there were four of us in the Jeep, uh, four huge hockey bags piled on top. Michael, you had SUV, SUV, not Jeep. SUV. Oh, I should only Suzuki, been so SUV. Lucky. I, I appreciate your uh, your creative memory, but it was, only, it was only a tiny Jeep and small it was. Um, and we had to, even in the middle of winter, now it's not that cold in Israel, we had to leave the windows open because unlike most Canadian facilities, there were no shower facilities at Bat Yam. And after playing two and a half, three hours of hockey, you can only imagine the aromatic experience in a small Jeep uh, for a two hour drive up north dropping people off. And I remember getting home usually about 3.30 in the morning after those practices. Um, anyway, that's my, that's my recollection. Anyone else have anything else they'd like to share? Or Dan? I'll give you a couple. One was just an interesting, my first experience with Israel hockey um, is when we arrived in South Africa and I came along with four or five other guys to meet all of you back in early 1992. So I, I recall distinctly, we flew in on March 16th, 1992. And uh, the guys from Israel were coming in. You guys came in the following morning. You took the overnight flight. And what was interesting was I remember somebody telling us, don't unpack your bags because tomorrow was the referendum in South Africa, whether de Klerk was going to continue on with the reforms against apartheid. Mm -hmm. And that this was the first tournament, 1992 right. international tournament that South Africa had held, I think since 1967 or thereabouts. Mark might correct me if you're, if you're, if I'm wrong. Yep, you're um, right. I, I literally just remember that. And again, we all got to meet the Israeli guys, you know, who came off, off the plane at, you know, you guys took the mid, the, the red eye and you arrived right at the rink. We met you there and I'll share that story. And if I may share one more right after that. So, Literally, I remember meeting, that's when I met Run for the first time. I met all you guys for the first time. And there was an international rink. We're all gathered by the rink. Everyone's saying, hello, how are you? It's great to meet you. And finally, someone said after five, guys, listen, we got practice. Let's go, let's go into the, let's go get changed. So everyone starts picking up their bags, except for one kid, this six foot one, 185 pound kid named Ron Oz. And he starts undressing right there beside the rink. And I said, <laughs> what are you doing? He's like, I'm getting dressed for hockey. So, no, no, no. We go into the dressing room. There were no dressing rooms, obviously, in Israel. So that was my <laughs> first experience. And Ron had to learn all about, you know, never mind what a blue line was and everything else in Israel. So that was one. But I'll, I will say my craziest experience um, was, again, I, I suspect you guys will remember this. We had training camp in, I think it was, uh, it was one of the preliminary tournaments where we were in Sofia, Bulgaria. Right. And uh, we had an exhibition game and we finished the exhibition game at around 11 or 1130 at night. And everyone and the, the plan was to take the overnight bus so that we would arrive in Ankara, Turkey, the following morning at about 930 a.m. It was supposed to be a nine hour bus ride. So we all piled up. We were supposed to get a deluxe tour bus. And bottom line is the tour bus was a little bit small, it was a little bit better than a bus uh, than a school bus. All the equipment went underneath and suddenly there was no more equipment to go underneath. So they piled it into the back row. The last six rows of the bus were taken. I don't know if you guys remember this. And we were basically, everyone piled next to each other. And long story short is this nine hour bus ride turned into a 21 hour bus ride. From, the, from midnight the night we arrived at the hotel and Mike, I'll one up you. If you think driving for two hours with four guys in a Jeep is, Try to, if you remember, nine hours, uh, or sorry, 21 hours with the equipment stinking in the back and then everybody, and there's no McDonald's or anything to stop on the side of the road, if you guys remember that. Um, anyway, so that was like the crazy 21 hour bus ride with, um, again, and people did not like each other after that. I literally remember sitting next to you, Mark, for, for part of that. <laughs> and I think I chose you because you're, no disrespect, you're not the biggest guy in the world. So next, next to you. I mean, I've got lots more, but that's all that we can talk about probably, in, you know, that's not PG rated. Okay, so I, I, I'd like to tell something really short and it's not gonna be about hockey. So uh, I had the pleasure of, of coaching a, the junior national team together with Mike. Mike and I were co-coaches. Ron, Ron was the star of that team. 
Run was, I guess, 16 at the time? Mm -hmm. 16 or 17? And the tournament was in Lithuania. And we had spent a lot of time training. We had worked really, really hard with this group of kids for a long, long time. And we decided that when we, when we took this on, that it was not just gonna be about hockey, that this was gonna be an educational environment. Um, and I'd like to relate two things that happened to us uh, that I'll never forget when we, when we were in Ethiopia, in Lithuania. So the first one is, it was pouring. Right before the tournament, it was pouring. And we got to a Vilnius and we visited the shul. And there are very, very few uh, congregants in the shul. And that was a, the night, the, the day before Purim. And they told us they hadn't read the Megillah, the shul for ages because no one knew how to do it. You guys should know that your ritual, a, 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 what's, what's, the, what's your job in the, in the shul, Mike? On a good day, they call me ritual director. Ritual director said, okay, tomorrow we're, we're going to read the Megillah together. Mike spent the next day buffing up on his Megillah reading. And for the first time in about 20 years, there was pouring in that shul. And it was amazing. Like people, people were crying. I, I remember crying uh, through that entire Megillah reading. It, it was just an extraordinary event. And I'm not sure if it was the same day or the day after or the day before. We took a, the entire team. We went to a, several sites a, related to the Holocaust in a, not far from Kaunas, a, where most of the Jews at the time lived a, in Lithuania. And we visited a place called Yaarot Paner, where, which the, in English means the Panar forests. And, and these were killing fields. These, the, these, this was a place like Babiyal. And obviously all the Samamanim, all the symbols of the Holocaust were there, holes in the ground, it, it, it was horrifying. But we met people there that were sort of taking place of, taking care of the place. And they told us, Ron, I don't know if you remember this, there was a conveyor belt. Do you remember this, Ron? I do. Mike, can you finish the story? Well, actually, I, I was looking, there, there was, there was a, some kind of conveyor belt that, uh, I don't know exactly what the function was, but we found it lying kind of hidden on its side. And we got the whole team to, I don't, Ron, you probably remember this. We got the whole team to lift up that conveyor belt and set it upright. And as a matter of fact, I was looking at the, at the Ponari site on their website uh, earlier yesterday, and I saw a, that conveyor belt standing, it looks like, the way exactly where it was that we set it up right, because it was kind of hidden, buried under the grass, uh, unacknowledged, I suppose. I don't know if anybody, I don't know exactly what its function was, but there were, I agree with Mark, there was something very powerful about uh, and tangible about touching something and writing something in whatever way, literal or metaphorical, uh, that's part of the history and, and the tragedy of that site there. And, uh, you know, we didn't talk about numbers, but roughly 100,000 people were murdered there at that uh, at the Ponari site, 70,000 of them Jews. Uh, it's a whole other story. But as Mark was saying, you know, part of that trip was powerfully uh, impactful because of the connection. Uh, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> I was reading a report that Mark and I wrote after I returned from the junior team experience in uh, Lithuania. And we said that part of our function there, as we saw it, was not just to give those young kids their first experience of international hockey, as, as enthralling as that was for them, but to give them something to understand why, they, why they're representing Israel, to give them some connection to the fact that they're playing for a national team uh, that represents maybe not just Israel, but the, the Jewish people, um, you know, however we understand our connection with Israel. And I, I think the ability for us to engage with the Jewish community as it was at that time, uh, as well as visit sites that relate to the, the tragic history of the community there, uh, I'd like to believe, and you know, Ron can perhaps uh, add to that, 
what kind of impact that had on those kids in terms of their, not just their Jewish identity, but their team identity, their experience of, of sharing that kind of um, visit with others, uh, not just being there, but being there with the team and, and connecting that to, to hockey as well. And I'll, I'll just add to that, I'm wearing the yeah. jacket. I'm wearing the jacket of the outfit that was given to us in 1992 on our first trip uh, to South Africa and our first experience uh, as the Israel national team. And I want you to notice who, who sees the, uh, the beautiful Israeli insignia on the front of the jacket here. Does everyone see it? It was on That's the back, Mike. The insignia was on the back. <laughs> so. Hey Mike, in all seriousness, can I, can I add a comment? I'll just add a comment about that. I was, I, I helped, I remember specifically working with you and Mark on bringing the, the kids together and just for everybody on that trip, that first trip, that was the U18 squad, the first time Israel had ever had a junior team. And I believe about 11 or 12 boys came from Israel and we brought eight or nine fr from Canada. Um, who had through, through their lineage, through parents were Israeli or had been born in Israel. And I won't bore you some of the stories of how we got certain kids Israeli passports, which is a story in itself. But what I would say just to touch on what you talked about, Mike and Mark, was for me, what was interesting was, and Mike, we talked about this just the other day, of those nine boys, at least six or seven of them within the next two years made their first trips to Israel subsequent to that trip and their connection and what Mike and Mark had brought to them. I mean, for me, uh, I joke, I mean, hockey is the Israeli Canadian sport. It suits Israelis. It's fast. It's aggressive. You got to cheat a little bit sometimes. Um, and again, it's, uh, it was just something again, to what Mike talked about to bring the connection of those young men uh, who many of them went on to play for the Israeli national team for, for a number of years after. So it was just something, and I unfortunately couldn't make the trip. I did all the organizing and the schlepping in Canada. I think my dad went on that trip, and my younger brother right. played with Run. That's right. Um, uh, your, brother, your brother was there, Dad. I know, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I'm going to go back to the original question was uh, the craziest story that uh, <laughs> you can recall in hockey. So if you actually think about this, for me, it all, it all ties together that the whole thing is actually crazy if one's to think about this. You know, I'm, a, I'm an Israeli kid. We heard about the Holocaust. I'm not coming from, uh, I'm coming from a, a little place called Bnei Brak, which is very ultra Orthodox. Um, we were not a wealthy family. So for me to go and see the world was almost impossible at that time. Uh, and all of a sudden I'm being taken into this magnificent, wildly world that is completely other than hockey was terrific because anything I have to actually, you know, I, I'll give you a, a short example is, is the tournament that we went with Mike and Mark, which is absolutely up until this day. And the way I'm raising my three children is based on everything has to be educational as well, not just the cause of the, uh, whatever it is they're doing. And it was, it was quite extreme to me when all of a sudden, you know, you learn something in high school and I, and I, and I can't just came back from, you know, if it happened to be, uh, we, we played a tournament in Poland. So we happened to go to Auschwitz. If we're playing Lithuania, anywhere pretty much in Eastern Europe, for that matter, um, you know, just to see the wonders of everything of being Jewish related to everything you are doing through hockey. Uh, that was absolutely terrific. And then uh, it happened with the, the whole Roger Nielsen in Israel, how everything was all about correlating and combining Judaism through hockey. And to see the connection there with how many, how many more souls you can reach through that that was uh to me that was the craziest part all of a sudden you, know, you realize wait a minute it's, it's a lot bigger than what i am doing other than hockey and to to summarize all up is a couple of years ago i happened to be uh coaching because i can't play anymore <laughs> um i happened to be coaching the national team the senior team i was assistant coaching and then we happened to to win the first game and you know i all of a sudden i feel like you know there's a teardrop and I didn't understand all my emotions kind of took over everything because it was completing a circle in a sense. And, and I was very, very proud to see kids like uh, Oded's son was joining us for that tournament. And he's a 16 year old boy. And to just, I, I was looking at him and it's almost like I had to, it's almost like I was reliving my own way through it. So that was, that was very crazy to me. That was, that was the, 
circle of it. You know, Mike, Mike, Mike read the newspaper clipping on the Turkey game, but I remember after that Turkey game. So the way it worked in the tournaments was that uh, at the beginning of the game, they played the anthem of the International Hockey Federation. Yes. At the end of the game, they played the anthem of the team that won. Mm -hmm. If it was a tie, they would play the anthem of the International Hockey Federation again. And after we played Turkey and we had won, both teams were lined up on their blue lines and they started playing a tikva. And there were 20 grown men plus run, he didn't count, <laughs> crying, crying. The tears, were, they were flooding down. There was water, the water melted under, the ice melted underneath my skates. And I don't think there was anyone there that wasn't crying. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, Ron talked about that tournament that they played in Lithuania. So Ron was actually the captain of that team. And if I remember correctly, Ron, you were voted the outstanding defenseman of the tournament. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, you know, there was some really, really, you know, Ron, I haven't seen Ron in 30 years. 100 years. You didn't change, Mark. I can. I can you, you know what? You turned out pretty good. You turned, wow. You know, you. good for you. Good for you, man. Thank you. Thank so, you. So. Mike, Mike uh, guys, I, I have to excuse myself. I'm sorry. I, I have a, a meeting with a hockey pair in here. And um, I would. I wish I could stay on and talk for another hour with you guys. But maybe, maybe another day. I apologize, Mike. Can you say hi to my daughter for me? I, I will. I will. I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank <laughs> you so much for joining us. Thank Jenny. you, guys. Take care, Jenny. Laugh, Thanks laugh. for inviting me. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's quite outstanding to to think about you know how your life just you know evolves, and even. Uh, through, through being Jewish and hockey, the combination there is quite unique. I have uh, pretty much every friend of mine plays hockey to, them, to some extent, whether it's university hockey, professional hockey, and whatnot. But being able to represent a country, um, I was very, very fortunate. I was at the right place at the right time. And uh, other than being extremely blessed with that, is, uh, is the fact that, you know what, now I feel the urge um, as contributing back. To something that gives so much to me, um, it, it is extremely important to give something back. And uh, Oda and I are trying. Oda and I and a couple, a couple other uh, people that are involved in hockey are trying to do something that uh, evolves around that. Uh, you know what, Oda? I'm going to let you talk if you don't mind. Again, I, I for me, it's been again. I'll, I'll share with everybody my story, such that I feel so blessed, as everybody else has said. I got to play on the first Israeli national team. I got to play with my brother, uh, who played with the national team for a number of years, and uh, and then now my 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 second son is hopefully going to be on the national team. And Ron and I, are, as he just mentioned, we're working with the Ice Hockey Federation of Israel, and we're going to get Mike and and Mark and and Sergey and a bunch of other people involved in uh, you know in, in building out the program um, with the hopes that actually my daughter is going to play on the first ever Israeli national team. So you can tell in Hebrew, I have a little bit of a machala. It's a little bit of a sickness about hockey. Um, but I mean, I think as one of the things from, from Ron and my perspective is we really, and I touched on it earlier, I mean, bringing together Canada and Israel, I'm involved in a number of different things. I mean, you know, we want, we want to, you know, tie, you know, both from a Zionistic, from a Jewish perspective, all the different areas. So um, yeah, we're working on something again to, to really, you know, we're, to bring the game of hockey and to, to connect Canadians and Israelis together on so many different levels. I mean, and hockey's just one. I mean, it's hockey's been played at the Maccabi F for the last few years. It's been a lot of fun. And, you know, um, so I, I mean, I can get into details, Mike. I don't think that that's what you wanted to hear. But um, again, that's it's hockey's touched my life. It's crazy. What's uh, and it's the friendships that we've made over the last 30 years have been incredible. I, I just want to share a couple of uh, uh, kind of diametrically opposed experiences with regards to. Uh, a couple of games in which we played way back. Uh, and it, it says, I think, something about our understanding of, 
of good sportspersonship, uh, understanding what we're doing there in terms of representing the country, uh, having a certain sensitivity of competition and fair play. And so, and I only learned this after the games because as a player, we weren't really privy to everything that was going on. So what am I referring to? Um, we had that first tournament and a first victory over Turkey back in, the, in March of 1992. But in order to qualify because of the emerging uh, nations from the former Soviet Union who had to enter the hockey pools at, at the lowest level and make their way up, uh, there was a qualifying term, tournament in order for Israel to participate in Slovenia the following year. And Oded mentioned the bus trip that we took uh, in order to get to that tournament in Turkey in Ankara, training in, in Bulgaria and then the traveling to, to Ankara. The teams we played against were Turkey and Greece. And so the, the first thing comes to mind, Turkey and Greece playing together, there's a war already before you even started the game. And there was that tension, but that, that's, that's, an, that's an issue in and of itself. The interesting thing was that the first game, uh, when we played, uh, we played, we beat Greece, and of course, uh, the Turks were, were rooting for us. They cheered us. They gave us a standing ovation after the game when we beat Greece. And then the last game of the tournament was when we played Turkey, the host country. And after the first period, the score was 7-1. And somebody who was there attending from the uh, Israel Ice Hockey Federation came up to Paul Shinman, who was involved in the coaching. He'd, he'd been he, one of the people who were involved in getting hockey off the, uh, getting, getting it going in Israel back in the, in the late 80s, uh, came up to him and said, listen, Paul, it's not good for hockey if your team beats us 30 to one or 40 to one. Can you do something about this? Like, can you, can you tell your team to lay back a little bit? And Paul said, to, There's, you know, that, that's not what we do. That's not sport. We, we don't do that kind of thing. Um, you know, we, we've got to we've got to play fair. We've got to respect the other opponent by playing as we should. And then, shortly afterwards, the Turkish coach came up to Paul and said something very similar. And then, so Paul related to me afterwards. He went to our coach Gideon Lee and asked him if there's something we could do. And so, in the second period, the I remember them coming to us to the players and giving us some kind of instructions as how we should play in the game, not run up the score. Um, because, the, so the refs started, the, again, apparently the refs were as part of this as well. The refs started calling all sorts of penalties against Israel. Every, the tiniest little infraction that we got a penalty. And eventually the Turks scored a few goals. And <laughs> we, we the, I guess the coaches decided enough was enough. And eventually we were given the green light to at least, if not score, at least to dominate play, pass around, look at it as some kind of a scrimmage. The, the final score, if I'm not incorrect, was 14 to four, I think like that. But they came up to the coaches afterwards. Again, we only learned about this afterwards. And they thanked us for being so considerate uh, about being respectful and trying to maintain the dignity of the host country because they, they said that can only be good for hockey in order to maintain this 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 good spirit and i certainly understood that while at the same time understanding the importance of genuine competition and teams respecting the other by trying as hard as they do i know that wasn't a conversation that the IIHF had in slovenia six months later with the captains or the coaches of the Ukrainian and the Latvian teams, uh, because we were thrashed by those two teams and why they were in our pool, as I mentioned before, uh, newly independent countries with former Soviet Union uh, players uh, that were playing on their teams. It, it was a ridiculous situation. In any case, we lost to Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken, 29-1 and to Latvia 32-0. But Interestingly, Paul shared this afterwards. Uh, somebody who eventually became head of the IAHF, uh, Rene Fasal, came up to him in the middle, I think it was the Latvian game, and he said to him, listen, Paul, I know this is tough, but I really admire the tenacity of your players. They're giving their best out there. They're not giving up. They're trying their hardest, and that's, that's really, really admirable. I know these circumstances aren't ideal, but we really admire that. And to me, it says a lot about the idea of... of how we relate to sport, how we relate to each other with a certain respect and dignity, admiration when it's called for, even under the harshest of, <laughs> of competitive circumstances. And those two very different experiences that Israel shared on either end 
of that competitive spectrum uh, are something that I recall very, very fondly on, on a regular basis. Anyone else? No, I mean, I think those, those are great stories, Michael. I mean, there's some unfortunate incidences that we experienced. I mean, the team's experience as, as, as a Jewish team and as an Israeli team, uh, you know, without getting into too much details, it was an unfortunate one in 1996 with the U-20 squad that Ron, I'm sure, remembers very well. Uh, we were playing Hungary and, you know, there were some blatant anti-Semitic remarks. Um, and in the end, it turned into a bench clearing brawl. And, uh, you know, good. For, and our, but on the one hand, it was it was an unfortunate in the sense that many of our kids had never experienced anti-Semitism. And Ron being an Israeli boy, I mean, he can talk, he may have, but it's it just something that was not that they were they had never heard of. And even many of our boys who had come from Canada had grown up in a, in a nice neighborhood in Toronto. Um, and it was just, it was very unique. And again, me being unfortunately what I return, some, some term, sometimes terms myself as a puckhead, I was happy the boys stood up for themselves and it, was, it wasn't pretty, um, but we beat them up. I mean, it was just, it was kind of a, it was, it was an unfortunate situation, but what happened was you saw the camaraderie, you saw the recognition of the boys. Um, and again, an understanding unfortunately sometimes what it means to be a Jew and how you have to stand up for yourself um so that's unfortunately some of the negatives I mean going back to that turkey experience I also remember uh getting on the bus and there was the big sign at the front of the bus with uh with an Israeli flag and we had security with us and the Shin Bet right. guy grabbed it and said what do you need we don't need bullseyes on our back I mean let's take you know you don't have to do that so unfortunately I think again and I refer this to many of our at, at times Canadian kids have joined the Israeli kids, they've recognized what it means to be an Israeli athlete, which unfortunately, you know, has not negatives with it, but an awareness of who you are at all times. Um, you know, so it's just interesting experiences from a cultural perspective for many of our boys. No, I always so, felt, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Go, go ahead, Ron, go ahead, Ron. I, I always felt that the, uh, you know, Every time there was a little, you know, something going on on the ice, whatever it is, physical, I always felt that, you know, we have to stand up for ourselves and whatnot. And every time I used to go back to Israel after a tournament, my grandfather, uh, rest in peace, who knew nothing about hockey, always asked me about, so how did you do? And I explained to him, you know, how excited I was that we, we played this and we did that. And, uh, you know, all the, the, you know, at the end of the conversation, he always asked you always ask me, you know, were you a proud Jew? And I always said, yes, you know, we stood up for ourselves. And uh, he said, you remember, you know, the best thing you want to, if, if you ever want to like win anything, just make sure the national anthem is being heard and people are standing for it because there's a reason for that. And, you know, as I grew older and I started noticing that, you know, it's funny enough, I, we played a tournament uh, a few years back and we played a tournament in Belgrade and, and it was really unpleasant environment for it to be to be Jewish yeah. at, at, at a certain time of the year that we were there I guess so or and uh we, we won a couple games or three games out of the five games we played and then you can see the the crowd just you know standing for the Atikva and the, the Israeli flag is being raised and you know I, I didn't really notice my players I just noticed the crowd how they are interacting with this and how you know, more and more people are actually standing where in years prior to that, people would just leave. They just had no, no respect for it. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like, okay, there's a recognition that people start to understand that we're here and we're not going to leave. And, and that's how it's going to be. And if it's through hockey, it's fantastic. So, you know, that's, that's how I saw it. So I just, I just want to add to, to, to this, this theme. So Mark, when I asked before, when I showed that uh, jacket, from the 1992 team it has no insignia whatsoever on the front. It doesn't on the back either. It was only the following year that we put the Israeli insignia on the on the team uh, outfits because of some of the things that you're mentioning. There was this apprehension that first year about traveling abroad. We don't know. We didn't know how we would be received. And as Oded mentioned, with the sign on the bus. Uh, we didn't want to have a, a mark on ourselves that might uh, lend itself to unfortunate incidents, which, which were the experience in, in other years. And I know that initially when I saw that outfit, uh, it kind of troubled me. I didn't really share it with anybody, but it bothered me. 
uh, because I've been aware of something like that earlier on. I just want to read you a letter I received. I'm not going to mention the school, uh, and it has nothing to do with hockey. But this is a, I was uh, back in 1982. I co-coached the chat basketball team, and we of course uh, participated at that time in the TDCAA, the Toronto District Catholic Athletic Association, because there was no Jewish organization of schools. And we had an interesting incident at one of the schools. And this is a letter that was sent to us um, a couple of days after. To the coach of the junior basketball team of chat, I would like to express my apologies to you and your team. I'm very sorry about the incident that happened during the basketball game yesterday. I've just realized to what I just realized what it must have meant to you and your team. I would like to ask you not to take it against my school. I would once more like to express my Sincere apologies, yours sincerely, whoever it was. So, you know, growing up in a Jewish environment and going to a Jewish day school, until that incident, I really had no real experience with uh, anti Semitism, let's call it what it is. Uh, and when I came to Israel, uh, you know, being aware of that in North America, the sense of pride that Ron and Oded and Mark have spoken about with regards to representing Israel. Uh, at the same time as we knew we may encounter some of those uh, among our competitors and others who weren't crazy about the country, uh, there was something about the, the pride of, of being there, hearing the Hatikva whenever we were able to win a game, and, and, and sensing that um, unique opportunity to represent a country with, with incredible pride. And when Mark uh, shared before the experience that first time we heard Hatikva in that tournament, uh, there was nothing. There was nothing like that. And when you, uh, if you ever have a chance to see the film "Skating Through the Sand," which was made uh, during the tournament, the second time we were in South Africa in 1995, uh, a number of the players mentioned the fact how impactful hearing Hatikva uh, in the sports competition, as with any type of experience where you're representing your country, but certainly in sports as well, uh, to hear that. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine the pride that one feels when you have the ability to, to represent a country. Let's face it, there, there are dreams that people, there's fantasies that people have about being able to represent their country. I mean, people in Canada fantasize playing on Team Canada to be able to represent Canada. That's a fantasy because uh, there's almost none of us would ever have that opportunity. Then there's a dream that people have. You know what, perhaps if I work hard enough, uh, they, they can dream about being able to represent the country. Uh, and then there's the reality of being able to work towards the point where you're actually going to be representing that country. And for me to be able to experience that third stage of, of representing a country uh, for me in, in Canada, I mean, I'm probably the least skilled of all the, the people here on the screen in terms of hockey skills, but to be able to be in a position at the right time to be able to play for a country, to be able to play for Israel, uh, is something I would never even fantasized about as, as a young person and never would have thought that would be possible, uh, certainly in hockey. And I, re I remember for me, that ability to put on that sweater for the first time, maybe I'll go get that sweater. I think I have it in my, in my room somewhere to show you what it looks like. But to be able to put on that sweater, that Israeli national team sweater and skate out on the ice for the first time with that sweater on my back uh, that for me was even more powerful than hearing the Hatikva. Just to be in a public place representing a country and being proud of having that on my chest and on my back uh, was something I think that only those who've had the opportunity to experience that can, can fully understand. Um, Incredible. <laughs> well said, Mike. Yep. Very well said. Mark, were you number nine? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that first game against Spain, when we lost 23 to four, if I remember correctly, we were the only team that scored more than two goals on Spain. Correct. And I had my nose broken twice in that game. I remember a couple of things about that game. I also remember our goalie, David, almost having a heart attack after yes. this period. Yes. Um, he, I think the one thing that people don't re, may not know, South Africa is at a higher altitude. It's not, it's not at high, uh, very high, but the air is a little bit of, a, a little bit thin. And our 40 year old goalie, 
uh, who had, had come, I think, and uh, he basically collapsed yes. after the first period. Uh, and Boris came in there as a backup. A Mormon, I think. No, I don't think it was Boris. Gregory. It was Gregory. 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 That's right. Gregory. Gregory. Thank you. Boris wasn't there. It was Gregory. Oh, it was Gregory, yeah. yeah. So without reminiscing too much, Mike, all, all I'll say for me is hockey's given me so much in my life. I mean, aside from the people here, I've known Ron now for almost 30 years. And at one point he was my adopted son when he came here to Canada for, for a year and a half. I actually had custody of him. Uh, again, as I said, I've been blessed. My, my brother's played. Now my son has played in the Maccabi games and the connections that it's brought for my kids, you know, to Israel uh, has been unbelievable. So uh, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a trip. And uh, yeah, I, I'm done playing, <laughs> but uh, hoping to pass it on to a better generation. So, hey, are you, are you still with us? I, I, I apologize for not calling on you earlier, you know, not seeing the picture. So, hey, you still there? Yeah, I can give you my phone number. You could call me anytime, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> just you know, my no problem saying this. Right. Sergey, I'm going to ask you to just say something in a minute. When I called Sergey, and I hadn't spoken to him in, in 25 years, Sergey said to me in his most honest and direct approach, where you been? Why didn't you call me before? All of a sudden, you call me. Where, 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 why didn't you call me earlier? Anyway, Sergey, I called you now. I'm glad you're here. This is there anything not how I told you. you. This, is not, like, this is not how I told you. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share, Sergey, about your hockey experience? Well, um, I, it's uh, again, it's the coolest game on earth, and um, what hockey does for living, it shows up who you know people truly are. And uh, I learn a lot uh, from hockey that uh, you can figure out people much faster because you see them naked in a dressing room, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it would be very difficult to say something after that. Uh, that would be a great conversation. Say hi to your brother Borat for me. Yeah, as usual, Sergey. <laughs> as usual, Sergey is like leaves it. Yeah, doesn't get any better. Oh, well, a speech so we, we, we wanted to leave an opportunity for people maybe just to ask a couple of questions, but I want to just share one last quick story with you before before we do that. Um, one person I, I, I it would be very negligent of me not to mention his name because he was he was a, f a phenomenal guy and uh, part of that first uh, team that played together. The oldest guy in the team, somebody by the name of Roy, and now phenomenal story about him uh, moving from a place in Wawa, Ontario, not Jewish, uh, fell in love with Engedi back in the '60s, moved there, ended up marrying somebody. There's, there's a great story, and you know how all good mythology starts. There's some truth to it. Whether the entirety of the story has the veracity you'd like to believe it does, I don't know. But Roy lived in Engedi and trying to get up to play hockey, whether in Jerusalem or in Batyam, was no small ordeal. So there is this, this wonderful story about Roy going out onto the highway by the Dead Sea at a bus stop, waiting there with his hockey bag and his hockey stick holding it up like this, and people passing by without stopping to give him a lift, although he's trying to get a lift, because they just thought he was some shepherd with his shepherd's crook there standing <laughs> by the side of the road. Anyway, Cora, we'll open it up to uh, perhaps a few questions if anyone would like to ask. Great, thanks. If anybody would like to ask a question, feel free to unmute, or you can send a chat and I can ask it for you. And perhaps we can go to the grid now so we can see everybody. I have a question. Uh, well, comment first. Uh, first of all, it was great to watch Jewish hockey hot stove. <laughs> like, like watching uh, Hockey Night in Canada. Um, I'm curious 